Tonight, housing help with conditions. The new offer from Ottawa that needs buy-in from the provinces. A pledge from the Prime Minister. Canadians need help on affordability. Aimed at creating more multi-unit construction. The federal government is, I think, picking a fight here. An Israeli airstrike kills aid workers in Gaza, including a Canadian. They have to be protected. It's pretty alarming. Definitely, it's scary. Plus, an 11-year-old boy is attacked and killed by two dogs in Edmonton. Also, what to do with a 200-year-old shipwreck that's now out of the water. It's not only the talk of the town, it's the talk of the whole area. And remembering a comedy legend. You're going to be scared right out of your pants. From SCTV Breathe that way. to Hollywood, the many characters of Joe Flaherty. Well, you're fine. Get out of here. CTV National News with Omar Sachedina. Reporting tonight, Heather Butts. Good evening. The federal budget won't be tabled for two more weeks, but the Liberals' latest pitch is a promise for more money for housing. The $6 billion infrastructure fund meant to speed up construction comes with conditions and requires provincial buy-in. CTV's Annie Bergeron-Oliver reports. Another day, another spending announcement, bringing the government's total of pre-budget promises to at least $8.6 billion. Canadians need help on affordability. Canadians need help with housing. Canadians need help uh, with things like a food school program. Uh, so that's why we are stepping up. Over the last week, the Prime Minister has announced a slew of new programs. One billion over five years for a school food program. One billion in low-cost loans for some child care providers. And 15 million for a new tenant protection fund. Today, more housing cash. A $400 million top-up to the Housing Accelerator Fund that it says will build an extra 12,000 homes within three years and a new $6 billion Canada Housing Infrastructure Fund. Most of that money aimed at building multi-unit apartments and multiplex townhouses will require agreements from the provinces and territories. The federal government is, I think, picking a fight here. What they're trying to do is say, listen, premiers, you either bring in the kind of intense density, the kind of growth we want to see around things like transit hubs that need to happen, or else we're not going to give you the money, we're going to give it directly to cities. Experts say the Liberals are using these announcements to set themselves up for the next election, which polls show the Liberals are in danger of losing. The latest Nanos poll shows the gap is closing, with Conservatives down 5 points to 37.5%. The Liberals are still a distant second, but up 2.4 points to 25.7%. The NDP remained third, and the Bloc fourth. The Liberal gains have been in vote-rich and seat-rich Ontario and uh, they've been able to narrow the gap. That's really where the game is for the Liberals if they want to hold on to power. With more spending in the works, many economists wonder what the deficit will look like. When you add them all up, what you do want to see is this government actually started to, to spend less to recover some of the fiscal space that was lost during the pandemic. Liberal sources say to expect almost daily announcements from now until Budget Day on April 16th, and most of them, Heather, will be aimed at young voters. A critical demographic, Annie, thank you. The public inquiry into foreign interference is underway and heard NDP leader Jagmeet Singh was among those warned of potential threats. CTV's Judy Trin explains. In the morning, a revelation surfaced that after the murder of Sikh activist Hardeep Singh Nijjar, NDP leader Jagmeet Singh also faced threats. And Mr. Singh also received a, 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 a similar report and a warning um, that he was facing a potential threat to his life without... Uh, any details on the source, is that correct? I can't speak to that. And is that for reasons of national security confidentiality? Yes. No, no, no. For now, Indian interference is taking a backseat to China's alleged meddling in the riding of Don Valley North in Toronto. We'll get through this. Han Dong quit the Liberal caucus after allegations surfaced he may have won his 2019 nomination with the help of the Chinese government, including the organization of a busload of international students. Details Dong remembered just a day ago. Uh, I was told by the campaign uh, that uh, they were um, 
students came in uh, in a bus. Dong testified he didn't know who organized the bus, but he did visit a group of high school students from the New Orient International College and encouraged them to get involved. Encouraged them to volunteer for my campaign. And for those who are eligible, I encourage them to register as liberal members so they can vote. Liberal Party rules allow delegates as young as 14 to vote for nominees. You don't have to be a Canadian citizen, but you do have to show proof you live in the riding. But Dong's 2019 campaign manager testified they shouldn't have cast ballots. Unless they um, were permanent residents, permanent residents and had some form of ID, they would not be eligible to vote. A key fundraiser for Dong's campaign, Michael Chan, also has allegedly close ties to the Chinese Communist Party. In testimony, Chan distanced himself from Dong. Do you recall if you were present when he announced that he was running for the nomination? I... I can recall. But this video clearly shows Chan at Dong's nomination announcement in 2019. Tomorrow we'll hear from conservative candidates, including former leader Aaron O'Toole, about the impact of Chinese meddling on their campaigns. Heather. Judy, thank you. To tragedy in Edmonton now, an 11-year-old boy is dead, killed by two large dogs at a home he was visiting. Animal control officers say they were called to that same home twice this year. The attack has left neighbors shaken with more questions than answers. CTV's Nav Senga is following the story. Animal control officers have been to this home before. This year, they responded to two attack complaints that occurred inside. Police say this latest deadly attack also took place inside the home, and it happened when the 11-year-old boy came to visit someone who lived here. This video shows the scene Monday evening. Police cars, fire trucks, and EMS can be seen lined up the block. Police say they came to this home just before 8 p.m. When they arrived, they found a severely injured 11-year-old boy. In a news release, they described the animals that attacked him as two very large dogs. Police attempted life-saving measures until EMS arrived, but the boy died. The two dogs were taken by animal control peace officers. Video shows the moments before the dogs were loaded up and taken away. You can see police and a woman standing outside the animal control vehicle before the woman grabs a flashlight and heads to the backyard. One neighbor I spoke with says you could hear the two dogs fighting with one another constantly. We've never even came into contact with these dogs and I'm glad we haven't. Um, so, But my kids could have potentially come into contact with these dogs. So. It's pretty alarming, um, so it definitely it's scary. Police say the dogs belong to a person who lives at the home. An autopsy is scheduled for tomorrow. Police describe the two dogs as very large, but would not share the breed. We're also wondering what was the relationship between the 11-year-old boy and the dog's owner, and if that owner will face any charges. The city says the dogs have been the subject of multiple barking complaints in the past as well. Nav Sanga, CTV News, Edmonton. Still in Alberta, a police officer was injured and a dog shot dead during an attack in Calgary. Police were investigating what appeared to be an illegal encampment when the dog attacked one of the officers who fired his gun, killing the animal. The officer was taken to hospital with hand injuries. Two people inside a motorhome on the site were taken into custody. Turning to a major story overseas tonight, the deadly Israeli airstrike that killed seven aid workers delivering food to Gaza. The World Central Kitchen says it's mourning the loss of these heroes who are being remembered as brave and selfless. It's raising fresh questions about the strike that hit their convoy. Now some ships carrying much needed food are being turned around as organizations and countries, including Canada, demand safety for humanitarian groups. CTV's Heather Wright reports. Some of the bodies of those killed in Monday's airstrike in Gaza arrive at a hospital today. 33-year-old Canadian-American Jacob Flickinger has been identified by World Central Kitchen as one of its seven aid workers hit by an Israeli airstrike, along with citizens of Poland, Britain, Australia, and a local Palestinian man. These are some of the best people out there doing the most important work. Hey, this is Zomi and Chef. Australian Zomi Frankham is being remembered as a brave hero by her friends and family. People like Zomi are so selfless and only doing what they do because of their love for humanity. All seven people were working for World Central Kitchen, an organization founded by celebrity chef Jose Andres, which has been helping prepare and distribute food throughout the enclave. 
WCK says the workers were traveling in armored cars clearly marked with the World Central Kitchen logo. The vehicles were hit as they left the organization's Deer Albala warehouse, despite their movement having been coordinated in advance with the Israeli Defense Force. It just shows that operating in these types of situations, say IDF just can't seem to minimize the uh, collateral damage. Israel has taken responsibility for the strike, and in a rare public apology, Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu said his country deeply regrets the tragic incident, which has sparked swift condemnation from aid organizations, many countries, including Canada and the United Nations. This is unconscionable, but it is an inevitable result of the way the war is being conducted. More than 30,000 Palestinians have been killed during this war, according to the Gaza Health Ministry, while the death toll of aid workers is estimated to be at least 196, according to the UN. The more violent it gets for humanitarian aid workers, and as I said, this is one of the worst in recent history, um, the less likely it is that they're going to be willing to take those risks. <laughs> World Central Kitchen has for now paused its work in the region. Today, the organization's CEO accused Israel of using food as a weapon of war. Heather. CTV's Heather Wright, thank you. A powerful earthquake has rocked Taiwan's east coast. The 7.4 magnitude quake rocked the entire island and collapsed buildings in at least one town. Power was knocked out in several parts of Taipei, sparking a tsunami warning for the islands of southern Japan and the Philippines. More than 50 million Americans are on alert tonight as severe storms barrel across central and eastern states, bringing tornadoes, rain, damaging winds and snow. A state of emergency has been declared in Kentucky, while in Ohio, strong winds and blinding rain virtually brought traffic to a standstill, the severe weather leaving a trail of destruction across multiple states. Violence in Finland has stunned the nation today. One child was killed and two seriously wounded in a school shooting. The 12-year-old suspect taken into custody. He came into the uh, classroom behind us, then shot three people. Police caught the suspect less than an hour after the shooting. The suspect and the victims were all sixth graders. A national day of mourning will be observed on Wednesday. There are concerns over how the mental health of teenagers will be impacted by a new feature on Snapchat. The app is allowing some users to see how they are ranked by their friends. CTV's Allison Bamford explains. These students might be out of school for the week, but Snapchat is keeping them connected with their friends. It's like my go-to app. I use it multiple times a day. And keeping tabs on who they chat with. I like it, honestly, because then I can see like who I've been snapping the most. The friend solar system is a feature on Snapchat Plus that ranks your top eight friends based on how much you message them. Mercury is your closest friend, while Neptune is farthest away. Users can see where they fall in their friend's solar system, but they can't see who else is in the digital orbit. The design essentially is actually making teens feel in many ways uh, jealous of their rankings, but also it really means that I think people are feeling even lonelier uh, if they don't make that list. Some experts say the ranking system of sorts turns relationships into a game at a crucial developmental stage for youth. It gives you a false sense of where you are in your social grouping, of who you might be. It's part of a growing conversation around social media and mental health. You and the companies before us, I know you don't mean it to be so, but you have blood on your hands. Earlier this year, social media CEOs testified at a U.S. Senate hearing focused on online child safety. And just last week, Florida's governor signed a bill that would ban children under 14 from using social media. In Canada, Ontario school boards are suing social media giants for allegedly disrupting students' rights to education. It shouldn't be up to school boards to have to sue social media companies. We should have these things in place already. Snapchat says the feature is one of many that's meant to engage users and can easily be toggled off. The company also noted it's only available for Snapchat Plus subscribers, which make up about 1% of global Snapchat users, and the vast majority are over the age of 18. Allison Bamford, CTV News, Regina.
A day after the cost of carbon increased, Ontario Premier Doug Ford slammed the tax, calling on the federal government to scrap it. This carbon tax has to go, or in a year and a half, the Prime Minister's going. It's simple as that. He will be going, I'll guarantee you. Conservative leader Pierre Polyev penning a letter to Trudeau requesting within six weeks of receiving this letter, you convene an emergency meeting of Canada's 14 first ministers to discuss the carbon tax crisis. Polyev also calling on Trudeau to allow provinces to opt out of the price on pollution. The prime minister is pushing back on that proposal, but says he remains open to alternative solutions. Coming up, remembering a star of the Canadian sketch series SCTV. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I am Guy Caballero of the SCTV Network. I'm president and owner, as you may well know. From TV staples to movie blockbusters, tributes pour in for Joe Flaherty. Plus, moving a mystery that washed ashore. The entertainment world is mourning a massive loss. A master of sketch and improv comedy, Joe Flaherty has died at the age of 82. He was American but delighted his Canadian fans on the legendary series SCTV. Here is Andrew Johnson. The sketch show SCTV spawned an entire generation of Canadian comedy. Now the legendary Second City Improv team is down another member with the loss of Joe Flaherty. He had so many great characters, they were all funny, right? Flaherty was one of SCTV's original writers and performers, an American who migrated to Toronto, bringing to life the likes of Count Floyd. You're gonna be scared right out of your pants or dresses, or whatever you wear. <laughs> and TV executive Guy Caballero. I'm president and owner, as you may well know. Castmate Martin Short describing Flaherty today as the anchor of the show and the funniest man in the room. Later, Flaherty popped up all over the place, including the Back to the Future universe. Is your name Marty McFly? Flaherty perfectly filled the shoes of a worrywart father in cult comedy Freaks and Geeks and in one of his most memorable roles, making life miserable for Adam Sandler in Happy Gilmore. Hey Gilmore, you suck, you jackass. Sandler offered his condolences today to the man he says he worshipped growing up, the nicest guy you could know. Flaherty also took time to mentor the next generation. I will always remember just how generous he was to me, uh, how enthusiastic he was, uh, how great of a teacher. I demand respect. <laughs> In recent years, Flaherty taught a comedy writing course at Toronto's Humber College. His family says he died yesterday after a brief illness. Joe Flaherty was 82. Andrew Johnson, CTV News, Vancouver. Still ahead tonight. The hometown hero who's shooting for the stars. Caitlin Clark has become the face of college basketball and has fans glued to the game. 12.3 million people watched Clark's dazzling display in Iowa's victory at March Madness, the most watched women's college basketball game on record. Here's CTV Sarah Plowman on her remarkable rise. Here's Clark. Clark pulls up another deep one. He's good! So many eyes on her, but opponents struggled to stop her. She's simply ridiculous. Caitlin Clark is synonymous for women's basketball. She's the NCAA's all-time lead scorer for men or women. Has celebrity fans like Jason Sudeikis. And last night broke another record, the most three-pointers in an NCAA career, as Iowa avenged last year's loss against LSU to head to the Final Four. A lot of people counted us out at the beginning of the year with the people we lost, and all we did was work really hard. and. 
to get back here is really hard. This region was loaded with so much talent, and, um, you know, the job's not finished. Clark scored 41 points with 12 assists, wowing fans and humbling opponents. I said, I sure am glad you're leaving. <laughs> I said, girl, you something else. Never seen anything like it. The point guard is headed to the WNBA draft. Raised in West Des Moines, Iowa, she's the pride of her home state. What she does on the court is magic. She's so fun to watch. Last year, this Iowan drove to Texas to cheer on Clark in the Final Four. This year, she's driving 11 hours to Cleveland to do it again. The atmosphere at the games is incredible. Um, Iowa fans really pack the arenas. Canadian players are watching too and see a role model. I honestly think she's a really big inspiration to a lot of young players. Even if she's scoring 40 points a game, she's still getting lots of assists. Clark studies marketing at University of Iowa. With her brand and name recognition, it seems, she may have already mastered that. She knows that the product that she's putting on right now is a perfect marketing formula for the women's game. Despite so many titles, there's one Clark doesn't have, national champion. Iowa takes on University of Connecticut in the semifinals on Friday. Sarah Plowman, CTV News, Fredericton. After the break, winning the race against time and tide. A long lost ship goes into permanent dry dock. We have an update to a story we first brought you a few weeks ago. A shipwreck that washed up on shore in Newfoundland has finally been hauled from the ocean in a savvy salvage operation. Here's CTV's Garrett Barry on the mystery ship. With just about everything this excavator could give, this giant mysterious boat is finally out of the water. Volunteers had to cut it into pieces for this heavy machinery to move it from the ocean. Now on land, it's a sigh of relief for this community who've been holding their breath for weeks, fearing every high tide would wash it away. Since we came on scene with it, it has busted its mooring seven times and we've had to tie it on eight times. Because no matter what we do, the water comes up and it, it wanted to take it back. Almost nothing is known for sure about this boat. It washed up here in a provincial park on Newfoundland's southwest coast 10 weeks ago. Some speculate it's about 200 years old, and it seems that just about everyone has a theory of where it came from. It's not only the talk of the town, it's the talk of the whole area. Like, we're getting people to, that come up on the beach, and they come from everywhere. Like, we've had them from everywhere. A closer look at the boat, now possible since it's on shore, reveals impressive work. Maybe a sign that this ship was an important one. In my opinion, anyway, it had to be something that was constructed to carry something heavy or deal with something like uh, traveling through ice, uh, ice areas and stuff like that. The community wants to move the wreck over to their lighthouse and build a small museum to contain it. We've had several hundreds of people uh, inquiring about it, and I think that this would be the boost that the Southwest Coast needs. You're going to need a big combination of fundraising and government funding to make that dream a reality. Careberry CTV News, St. John's. Fascinating discovery. That's our show for this evening. I'm Heather Butts. For all of us at CTV National News, thank you for watching. Good night, and I'll see you again tomorrow.